Okay, so welcome. Um, this is already in our fifth week, which is pretty amazing. How fast this class has gone by. And um, you guys are doing fine. What I would suggest is if any of you who are watching this, we're coming toward the uh, end weeks now. So if you have any outstanding um, assignments, now's the time to start thinking about getting them done. Because, you know, I have to be honest, according to the way the class is structured once the last week comes i have to uh enter grades I, mean, I don't have latitude on that you know it's not up to me when to enter grades so we're in week five by next week we'll be in week six if you're missing any assignments really important that you get those in okay really important that you get those in. so you know so far so good we've um like I said, I've graded everything so far. <coughs> so you know at this point whether you owe anything or you don't. But if you have everything in and it's all good grades, so far everything that has been graded, I'm very pleased with. So that's the good news, right? That's the good news. I'm very happy with what has been graded, okay? So this week, we're on week five. Let's open it up. And what are the objectives? Examine the components of the capital asset pricing model. Explore the relationship between systematic and expected returns. Calculate the capital asset pricing model. And analyze the criteria used for asset um, valuation. So let's talk a little bit about that because that's really what it's about. Let's look at the discussion for a minute. So the discussion revolves around. Imagine you're a new college professor developing your first lecture on the capital asset pricing model. How would you explain the concept to your incoming freshman class? In your discussion, include the relationship between the expected return of rate of return on a particular investment and the expected rate of return for a portfolio with multiple investments. What is the relationship between systematic and unsystematic risk? And analyze how the risk relationship related to the beta. Analyze how the risk relationship relates to the beta of an investment. In your reply post, comment on someone else's. So, I've already added today, and I've already added a, and you should see it, I added in a few spots, the, the, the um, PowerPoint that I'm going to use this morning. So you could, you know, this is for you, for whatever you want. You can download it. Let's open it. And you can pick it up just by owning it, but, but, but by opening it. But it's here, and we're going to be going over that. So that's one thing, you know, that's for your edification. The other thing I'm going to add to the discussion this morning, we're going to talk about it, is diversification. Okay, diversification. So, um, covariance. Covariance of investments. Okay, covariance of investments. So, we're going to talk about modern portfolio theory modern portfolio theory so let me add that this is another place where you could you know do a little give you a little extra work on it bear with me let's talk about that for a minute Bear with me. And I can add this on too. I'm going to add that last thing on that I just showed you. So before there was modern portfolio theory, what was there? 
Well, there was dividend discount models, right? We had dividend discount models, which we kind of touched upon. Let me just send this in here. Oh, this is loading. We'll talk. So there was the, the there was the Gordon dividend discount model. And if you want to know a little bit more about the dividend discount model, then just go to my um, finance academy and watch the video on equity value models. And what the dividend discount model basically told us was that you can you can discount the dividends of a company to get a value. So say, for instance, we knew the required rate of return on our company. And then the question is, how do we get the required rate of return? And that's what the capital asset pricing model helps us to do. But let's look at the Gordon discount model, the original way that companies were valued. They were valued as a function of cash flow paid to investors. That was the theory. So let's say a company paid $1.50 a year in dividends. And of course, if the company didn't pay dividends, there is a workaround. It's good. Sometimes people say, well, what happens if the company doesn't pay dividends? Well, there's a good workaround for that. You can actually assume the, the, the payout by looking at the retained earnings. Because remember, we know from the Digliani Miller theory that investors should be irrelevant whether they get money as dividends or they get it as cash flow that gets reinvested in the firm because it comes back to them either way. If they get the money back as a dividend, they can invest it. Or if the money gets reinvested back into the company, they're asking the company to invest it. So try to understand that concept. So whether a company pays a dividend or doesn't, it's really a function of their growth prospects and their cash flow. But let's assume this company does pay a dollar fifty dividend, and its required rate of return to investors by using the weighted average cost of capital is fifteen percent. And what is that? That's a combination of the cost of debt plus the weighted average cost of equity. How do we find the cost of equity? Again, we're going to talk about the capital asset pricing model. So when I divide 150, and if you watch that video, we get into all different methodologies, then the company should be worth $10. Because if I'm getting $1.50 a year on a $10 investment, I'm getting my 15% rate of return. And that's really what the Gordon dividend discount model tells us. Now let's assume that dividend is growing at 3% a year. And, and we know that in a lot of companies, dividends do grow. Well, then, all the only way we adjust for that, and again, watch the video, is to take the $10 and divide it by the product of the required rate of return less the growth. And now we get, oh, that's right. D7. Oh, it's the dividend, D7, I'm sorry. And now the value is actually a little higher, 12 and a half, because we're, we're reducing our required rate of return because we're growing. So even though the investors expect 15%, we're actually only demanding 12% because of the growth rate. So that's how things were done in the very beginning of the portfolio theory. But then modern portfolio theory is introduced. And modern portfolio theory starts with a fellow named, Nobel Prize winner named Harry Markowitz, who developed the efficient frontier in the 1950s. So going back to my text, and this is a kind of a kind of text you would use if you're in a doctoral program. Um, the capital asset pricing model has a, 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 a bunch of assumptions, and the assumptions are investors are risk averse. That means all investors want the highest rate of return for the lowest risk. That's what it means by risk averse. So we assume that every investor is rational. It's almost like economic theory. Every investor is rational. Every investor assumes that they want to have the highest rate of return with the lowest risk. So we make that assumption right off the bat. The same way in economic theory, we assume that when people go shopping in a mall or in a supermarket, they want to get the most value for their dollar. These are basic assumptions about human nature that we make, right? 
It may not necessarily always be true. We know through behavioral economics, sometimes people do irrational things. Sometimes people overpay for things. But we assume that all investors are rational. The set thing we assume is kind of on the same level, that all investors are price takers, that they'll accept the prices that come to them, and that they have the same expectations of rates of return. So that the information that's out there on securities is the same for all investors. There is no difference in what one investor sees in, let's say, for instance, in a stock like Apple, as opposed to what another investor sees in a stock like Apple. So we all have the same expectation. Is it true? It's a restrictive assumption. And when I say restrictive assumption, it, we, it, we know that it's not necessarily true. One investor might have better information than another. But we assume with the efficient market hypothesis that everybody has the same information and that the price of a security reflects all available information the strong form of the efficient market hypothesis. Three, we assume that there's a risk-free asset that you can put your money into, which is the 10-year treasury, say, and that investors can borrow or lend unlimited amounts at that rate. Again, restrictive. Investors can't necessarily borrow at the risk-free rate or lend at the risk-free rate, but we're gonna make that assumption for the purpose of our dissertation, okay? Because that's the third assumption. The fourth assumption is that all assets are fixed and they're marketable. So that means every investor can go out and buy these assets in a fixed quantity. They don't have to go ahead and buy it in unfixed quantities. Like what's an unfixed quantity? Like let's say we were looking at the housing market. Those quantities are not divisible. One house is very different than the next. You know, it's not a perfect substitute for one another. But in the stock market, we know that a share of stock is a share of stock and you can buy at least a share of stock. So that makes this whole idea of an efficient market more practical, right? We assume that there are no, inf that again, that information is available and that there's no cost to investments on any, co on any of the, uh, like there's no commissions. So assets of friction, again, restrictive. And, and finally, there's no taxes, regulations, or restrictions on short selling. So assuming that we have this perfect market well, then we can make the further assumption that all investors see the same information about all stocks and can make the same risk averse choice. And if we make that assumption, what we get is the efficient frontier. And with the efficient frontier, and, and, and one of the things we, you know, that I should mention before I go further, and we, for those of you who want to take this further, is there was something in the meanwhile called Rolls Critique. And Rolls Critique says, well, the market isn't necessarily efficient. The market isn't just the sum of all the stocks in the stock market. The market might be housing and precious metals and paintings and say vintage cars. But we're gonna make the assumption for the capital asset pricing model that the market reflects the market for all investments. Again, these assumptions are made because the capital asset pricing model wouldn't work without them. The capital asset pricing model basically is the first introduction to coming up with some sort of required rate of return for an equity. Because remember, bonds are equal, easy. If I know what I'm borrowing from the bank or I know what my the bond market, we talked about the bond market last week. If I know what the bond market is demanding from me, well, that's simple. If I'm paying 12% uh, to borrow money at 10 years, then that's my number, 12%, less my tax shield. So if it's 9% after my taxes, then any percentage of debt I'm using is gonna be 9% times that percentage. So if I'm 50-50 debt and equity, I know already that 48% of my required rate of return is gonna be debt because I'm borrowing at 12, after taxes it's nine, multiplied by 50% is 4.5%. Once again, if I'm borrowing at 12%, I already know that. I don't have to do any more work. I know where I'm borrowing money. I know what the market demands for me for my credit rating. And if I know I'm getting a tax break because we know corporate debt is deductible, well, then I'm essentially borrowing at um, 12, say 9% after my tax break. And if I have for my money, if my funding is in debt, well, nine times 0.5 is 400%. That's half of my required rate of return because I need a required rate of return because why do I need it? Why do I need it? Think about that for a minute. Why do I need a required rate of return? Think about it for a minute. 
I need it because to, in order to value a company, I either have to divide it, I either have to divide the dividend by the, the required rate of return, or more importantly, I have to divide the cash flows, the free cash flows of a company by the required rate of return. So once I know my free cash flows, I divide it by my required rate of return, and that's going to tell me what the value of my company is. Okay. So let's move on. Once I plot this set of securities, because what happens is one security on its own has a variance. We know how do we determine what the value of a security is, right? How do we determine that? Well, we determine it this way. We have three scenarios. 25% of my scenario is poor, bad market. 50% say I assume a normal market. And 25% equals a booming market. So it's that's the equal one. If you do the math, that's some. Um, probabilities always need to equal one. So then I make assumptions based on historical evidence, based on my own prognostications, based on Wall Street estimates. What should my rates of return be for my company in a bad market? Let's say 2%, I'll say 3%. If it's a normal market, let's say 10%. And if it's a booming market, I should make 20%. So then all I need to do at that point is take my probability multiplied by my expected rate of return, and then find those for all three scenarios. And then sum. And that's my mean variance. That's my mean return, I'm sorry. My average rate of return. 10.75%. When I find that average, I subtract it, right? I, I, I take the, the percentage, the percentage of each uh, probability, and I subtract these rates of return from the, from, from the average rate of return multiplied by the percentages, and I'm gonna come up with a variance. And after that, I'm gonna come up with a standard deviation. And that standard deviation is gonna allow me to figure out not just what my average rate of return is, in this case, 10.75%, but how much that variation should move from the average, right? How much that variation should move from the average. So, so let's assume I had three scenarios. 0.02, I'm looking at another stock. 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So I have those three scenarios, three different markets. Make it, make it pretty, I'm gonna make the percentages. Well, I could use Excel. You know, I'm not gonna go over. If you go into my um, Stats Academy, you're gonna have a lot of, um, and you go in Finance Academy, you have a whole bunch of videos I did on standard deviation. So I urge you to watch those because I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on stats right now. I'm just gonna go right to the chase here. But all I have to do at this point is ask for the variance. So go to formulas, statistics, Okay, go to variance. What I can do this pretty simple. And the variance on this portfolio is 5.2, And if I want to stand the deviation, Go to standard DV. It's 0.09%. Okay. 
So now I know that that's my my average rate of return. How do I know my average rate? Then just go to average. Excel, all you got to do is ask for the average. Come up with that number. It's 11%. So I know that this return is 11% with a standard deviation of just about 1%. Now, if I have two companies with the same average rate of return, say 11%, and one has a deviation of 2%, and the other one has one, we know through normal distribution that the 1% is less risky. Because 66% of the time, I should be within 12 or 10. And 95% of the time, I should be within 13 or 9. Whereas if I have a higher standard deviation, then those numbers are going to be a lot wider. So given two investments with the same risk, I should do better in terms of risk aversion with the lowest standard deviation. Once I come, now that would give me my return on an individual investment. But once I start to add securities to my portfolio, through the mathematics of covariance, right, covariance, Through the mathematics of covariance, the mathematics of covariance, I could get a lower rate of return. And what and that's part of modern portfolio theory. So what covariance tells me is that using the covariance formula, and we're not going to get too deep into the math right now. But basically what it says is, if I start putting stocks in a portfolio, if I buy a company that's exposed to oil, like say for instance, an energy driller that produces oil and is exposed to the price of oil, if oil goes down, they lose money and oil goes up, they make money. Well, then all I need to do is go out and buy a company that has the opposite effect, like an airline, who if the price of oil goes up, they lose money and the price of oil goes down, they actually make more money. And if I start adding stocks to a portfolio, I eventually lower my, what we call, unsystematic risk. My uns there are two types of risk in a portfolio, unsystematic and systematic risk. Unsystematic risk is the risk that's indigenous, indigenous to a stock. For instance, oil for a plane, for, for an airline, or to an energy driller. Um, people not wanting to take in too much sugar for Coca-Cola, but people not wanting to take too much, too much sugar might help a diabetes drug maker. All these things make up this unsystematic risk. And through the and through the covariance formula, if I put all of my variances together, I lower my overall risk. In other words, just try to understand this. Risk is not Deviation is not additive. If I keep adding stocks to a portfolio, I don't add the deviation. I actually reduce the deviation because they move in different directions. Stocks move in different directions. An oil company is going to move in a different direction than, say, an airline. A food processor is going to move in a different uh, di uh, direction than, say, a copper mining company. But as I keep adding stocks, I can eventually reduce the risk in my portfolio. And generally speaking, modern portfolio theory tells us that the more stocks I add, the lower I my the more stocks I add, the lower my risk. Probably after 30 or 40, I lower all my at one point, I can essentially lower all my unsystematic risk. My my unsystematic risk, which is my risk that's indigenous to my portfolio. And today's um and today's Keyword is going to be risk. So watch what happens. As I continue to add stocks to my portfolio, they keep canceling each other's risk out until all I'm left with is the systematic risk. So unsystematic risk, again, is the risk that comes up with, is the risk that we see with each stock on its own. It's the risk that exists in each stock on its own. But this, the risk that every stock has together for instance, COVID affected all stocks. A hurricane, a natural disaster, all stocks. 
a walk off a bit, all stocks. That becomes a systematic risk. So what portfolio theory tells us is I can hedge out my unsystematic risk and get it to down to the risk-free rate. Because once I hedge out all my risk, all I'm going to get is the risk-free rate. That's how arbitrage theory works. And that once I hedge out all my unsystematic risk, all I'm left with is the systematic risk, which is the risk in the portfolio. And that's the, the basics. That's the basis of, the, of Markowitz's efficient frontier. So what we see is, and using all this fancy math, which is basically the math behind the covariance and the assumption that all investors have the same view of the markets, we get this risk-free rate. And we get this, this, and if you plot all of the stocks in a portfolio and find their most efficient levels of risk versus return, you get a graph or a plot or a concave line that looks something like this. Anything below here, this on the x-axis, we have risk or standard deviation. And on the y-axis, we have expected rate of return. So anything below the median right here, we're not going to want to get involved in, right? Because I'm getting the same rate of return. I'm getting lower rates of return for the same risk. This is risk. This is return. So everything I'm going to want is going to be above this line, right? Everything I want is going to be above this line. Let me annotate for a minute. Everything I'm going to want to do is going to be above this line. So, because anything down here is inefficient. And then what I'm noticing here is anything above, now this is going to be, so then what we do is using calculus, and again, you don't need to get into the heavy math here, but if this is where I could put my money in the risk-free markets, then I can draw a line to this efficient market that's tangent to my efficient frontier. And using calculus, I can find the point where it's most efficient. That's just using calculus. That's how they originally did it. You just have to do a, um, a, a Newtonian calculus calculation. Once you've done that, you find the point M that's the most efficient. In, in and the assumption, it's most efficient. It's the highest rate of return given the lowest risk. And that is a function of all those assumptions we made at the very beginning of this video. All investors are risk averse. All investors have the same view. We know those are restrictive. We know that that's not necessarily true, but we believe that for the purpose of the capital asset pricing. And this line is the capital market line. It's the rate of substitution. So if I want a higher rate of return, right? I'd have to go above the line. And what this, notice that, the, that once I hit that efficient point, I can add on more return by taking on more risk, but it's marginally less helpful to me because it's such a more, it's, it's a kind of a shallow line. It's not like it goes up like it's, oh, okay, hold on a minute. Bear with me. Uh, it's not like once, a, uh, okay, why is this happening? Stop drawing for a minute. It's not as if um, when I add more risk, I'm going to get just as much return because then the line would look like this. No, I just get marginally a little more return. So basically, most investors are going to want to be right here. If they want more return, then they're going to borrow money along the capital market line. And that's going to be this. They're going to borrow more. And if they want less return and less risk, they're going to put more money into the risk-free asset, put more money into, say, risk-free bonds, and own less of the market. And they're going to be down here. So that means that's the assumption that investors can borrow and lend at the risk-free rate. But once they here on the line, they're in the most efficient part of the market. And that's the, the assumption we make when we look at the capital asset pricing. So where does that leave us? It leaves us here. It leaves us at a point where we get the capital asset pricing model. And each stock, now, so let me go to now my, now let me go to, so once we understand how diversification works, 
and systematic and unsystematic risk works. Now that you know the basics or the basis for the theory here, and the keyword is risk, we can go to my PowerPoint. So the capital asset pricing model helps in determining the proper discount rate when valuing equities. One could discount free cash flow using the capital asset pricing model. We just talked about it. Capital asset pricing model gives us the required return on equities. Bonds give us a retired rate on, on bonds. We combine the weighted average and we come up with a required rate of return. We assume all investors are rational and risk averse. Of course, we know that. That they're price takers and cannot influence the price of a stock. That's how we get the market rate of return. That we can borrow and lend at the risk-free rate. We just demonstrated that. And that we could trade without friction. So these are all our assumptions that are capital asset pricing model. And what the model tells us is if we take the risk-free rate plus the beta, which is the regression of the market minus the risk-free rate, we can come up with a uh, we can come up with the capital asset pricing model. And it was developed in the 60s by William Sharp. A bunch of different people kind of found this foundational theory and made it happen. And not all risks should affect asset prices. Not all risks, just the risk of the market plus the risk-free rate. We know that that's restrictive, but we also know that that's the underpinnings. And and the beauty of the capital asset price amount, and why it's still used today, even though it's not the most accurate, is that it's simple and it's generally pretty good. So that you should remember that as a practical matter. I just gave you a lot of theory. Let's talk practically as traders. It's pretty good. It's a good estimation. Is it perfect? By no means, but it's a good estimation. And so it gives us a pretty good idea. Think about it like when you go to the doctor, you, they look at your uh, cholesterol, your blood pressure, your, your, they take your blood work. Is that a perfect representation of your health? No, there's a lot of other risks that go into your health, but it's a pretty good representation. And it's simple and it's understandable and you can start targeting issues like, you know, things that they find in your blood work. As long as thankfully it's not anything horrible, okay? And so going back to my video, my, 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 my pages, I'm sorry, my videos, you should, these are the two videos on the capital asset pricing model, which is a kind of a regurgitation of this particular um, place that I'm giving. And, this is weighted average cost of capital, which we kind of reviewed. And I also gave you stuff on the financial worksheets. And then you have standard deviation, if you want to understand more about that. But here's the one I want you to look at. Calculating beta. Because what we're trying to do is measure the return on the market versus the return on a particular stock. OK, so if I do a regression and again, you got to go through regressions and hopefully your background in statistics help you to start at one point. Right. Hopefully your background in statistics help you at one point. Let me stop annotating. But what I'm going to get is a regression, right? How does a regression work? So I'm going to plot my expected return of my stock versus my expected return on the market. And I'm going to come up with all these points of where the market moves. I come up with all these points on the market against where the stock moves. Right? That's how regression looks, right? So this one point will be the market. One point will be where my stock moves. And then I'm going to get the best fitted line. And the beta of that is going to be some sort of relationship to my expected return versus the return on the market. So if it's one, it means my stock moves exactly with the market and the market explains my stock. If it's one and a half, that means my stock is considered more risky than the market because it moves one and a half times the market. And if it's 0.5, it's very safe. Maybe a stock like Coca-Cola that doesn't have a lot of risk. It's going to be less risky than the market. So Coca-Cola might look like this. The market 
exactly might look like that, and a one and a half might look like that. Now, 0.5 is a Coca-Cola. Why? Because it's less risky than a market. If the market does really well, we don't expect people to drink a lot more Coca-Cola, and the stock's not going to move that much. If the market doesn't do as well, we don't expect people to stop drinking Coca-Cola. But something like a biotech company or a risky tech company might move a lot because people are really worried about its relationship to the economy. Once I come up with these betas, I stop annotating. And all I need to do is plug it into the cap M. I find the risk-free rate, which is generally the 10-year treasury, plus my beta. So say the risk-free rate is 2%. It's 2% plus the risk on the market. How do I find the risk on the market? Generally, we look at the price-earnings ratio of the S&P 500. So if the price-earnings ratio of the S&P 500 is, say, for instance, uh, 10, 10 times earnings, it would be you're getting a 10% rate of return. So then 10% minus 2% is 8. 8 times my beta, say, if my beta is 1 is 8, 8 plus 2 is 10, and that's my required rate of return. Where else can I? Now, you can find beta by running your own regression, depending on what market you're in or what stocks you're in. Or you can go to Yahoo Finance and call up, say, Apple. And Apple, you could try this at home. Apple will give you a one, the beta based on five years of monthly returns, which is pretty indicative of what most investors would do. So that would be a 1.2 beta on Apple. Let's look at Tesla. What's their beta? Exactly two of the market. And that should, that should make sense to you. Tesla's a very risky stock. What about Coca-Cola? What's their beta? 0.61. So just as we talked about, the beta should be kind of relate to the risk. And that's what investors are telling you. That's what makes this CAPM so elegant. It's what investors are telling us. So we, the risk free rate is assumed to be the 10-year treasury bond because it's assumed to be the safest investment. We have the constitutional protection of our country. We have the monetary stability and we have political stability. So that's why we use the 10-year treasury. And in this particular instance, at this point in time, the 10-year treasury was trading at 2.96%. But you can go to the Wall Street Journal and find a quote on the 10-year treasury. And I also urge you to think about a student subscription to the journal. And there you go, 1.48%. And then through the magic of covariance, as we saw before, we got rid of all our unsystematic risk and all we have left is a systematic risk. And we diversified our risk away through covariance. That allows us to make the assumption, by making all these assumptions, that the only risk we have is the systematic risk, which is represented by this risk of the market minus the risk free rate that everything else is the risk-free rate because that's my unsystematic risk. That's all I'm left with. So again, once I've taken out all of my risk, I'm left with the risk-free rate, and that's counted for here, plus my regression to the market, which is beta, times what's left, which is the risk of the market minus the risk-free rate. If it's a beta is above one, the stock is less risky. I mean less than one. Beta is greater than one, the stock is more risky. Does it mean it's more risky? What it means is investors perceive more risk is really the way, you should, way, way we should look at it. Investors perceive more risk in stocks that move at greater velocities than the market, and that's why they're buying and selling them at greater velocities. And that's a representation of what I went through. Plus, there's going to be an error term in any regression, right? You're only going to learn so much about a stock's movements by progressing it against the market. And a lot of academic research on the capital asset pricing model has revolved around what other factors affect the price of a, of a stock. Farmer French in 1992 did a study, a famous study, where they found that the most influential um, effects on a stock are value, the, the stock having being a more value stock versus a growth stock. So, for instance, if you bought value stocks over growth stocks like Warren Buffett, 
over time you'd make more money because that was more predictive of returns. That that in the end of the day, investors value investors um, investors have more place more um, uh, value on on the uh, they place more value on the stock the, a stock that has steady rates of return that offers value than a stock that um, than a growth stock. You know, with time, those value stocks will do better. And then the other the other um, um, theory that they came up with, which has been kind of proven, and some fund and many funds have been gotten involved in, is that investors will place higher rates of return on smaller stocks rather than larger stocks. So smaller stocks will be more valuable over time and, and have higher rates of return. Further um, parts of the theory found that theoretical assumptions that betas change over time. And if we use just one beta, we may have a bad um, in indication of what the stock should be. That beta's change with events, right? All of a sudden, the stock might be a biotech that doesn't have a proven drug. And then all of a sudden, the drug is proven and the beta changes. It becomes more of a value stock. Because now the cash flows are more steady. So that's been one of the the the, the, the assumptions that were, that, were, that were talked about. Other assumptions were that, um, that, that were attacked was theoretically was that the risk-free rates change. So again, the capital asset model has come under a lot of criticism because it's a simple two-factor model. But for the most part, it's simple and it's and, and, and it's indicative. As I said, it's easy to use and it's mostly good. Um, later on, um, Ross and uh, Cox, Ross and Rube, you know, Ross and came up with the uh, arbitrage pricing theory. And that what that said is we don't need all these assumptions. Uh, by using the free arbitrage theory, uh, you could find a stock's rate of return by testing different factors. In their particular study, they found that things like industrial production, inflation, those sort of things, GDP, affect the prices of stocks, which makes sense. But that you can apply the arbitrage pricing theory to just about any stock. So once I have all of these factors and I have no more expected rate of return, then those factors have to be indicative of what moves the stock. Think about it. Think about what I'm saying. If if um, GDP affects my stock, if um, inflation affects my stock, if um, productivity affects my stock, and those three factors put together equal the, the, the risk of my stock and there's nothing left, I'm at zero, well, then you're saying that's the arbitrage theory, that those three factors will predict the price of the, the, what moves my stock. And I can use those three factors to predict future rates of return. But with the capital asset pricing model, we're just going to use the flat out. So I told you how to find beta and how beta is calculated. And please just watch those videos. And finally, when you do the market, and then to find the market, we find the PE of the market, which back then was 24, which means the market's returning 4%. So you find the price earnings ratio of this S&P 500, and that's going to tell you your market rates of return. Well, at least that gives you a good indication of your market rates of return. So there's your PE ratios. Very high PE ratios now, probably. If I look at the S&P 500, they're very high. So the market's returning very low returns, like 3%. Right? If I'm paying 37 times for earnings, well, one divided by 37 is going to be like 2.5% rate of return. On the market. So the markets are not are very overvalued using PE ratios. But if the markets continue to grow, we can justify those. And now I just take that rate of return minus my risk-free rate, multiply it by my beta. And I did Ford here, 2.96% plus 0.87, which is the beta for Ford, multiplied by the difference between what the market is returning minus the risk-free rate. And I'm going to come up with a capital asset pricing model of three, almost 4%. So it means Ford's expected rate of return on equities is going to be 4%. And if that makes up 50% of my my portfolio, of my, of my, of my um, Financing, then it's 
and let's say debt was another 4%, and that's the other 50, it's 2%, then blend it together, my expected rate of return is 4%, and I could discount my cash flows by that number. And again, this PowerPoint is going to be in the, I've added it to the classes. So don't forget, don't forget. Capital asset model helps in determining the proper discount rate when valuing equities. One could discount free cash flow sequence using capital asset pricing model. It assumes all investors are rational risk averse or price takers and can borrow in, 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 with immediate liquidity using the risk free rate. Can I trade without friction. These are all the assumptions. If we use the, um, if we use the, uh, arbitrage pricing theory, it'll come in a little different. So that's our class for today. Um, our keyword again is risk. And hopefully this is helpful. Any questions you have, you know where to find me. Thank you.